All right. Well, thank you all for coming to today's exciting special RHEL seminar, joint with M cubed. And as you know, the weather is insufferably hot, so it's good to have a talk about snow today. So for those who haven't met Jim Steinberg, he's a professor at University of Utah, and also known as Professor Powder, I found out, <laughs> and has done work in a wide-ranging uh, number of areas in mesoscale meteorology, uh, specializing in mountain and lake effect precipitation, numerical weather prediction, and a bunch of other things. Uh, he has his BS from the meteorolo meteorology in Penn State and a PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Washington. Was once a Fulbright scholar back in 2019 at the Innsbruck and is also known for his book, Secrets of the Greatest Snow on Earth. Weather, Climate Change, Finding Deep Power Powder in Utah's Wasatch Mountains and Around the World. Book I still need to check out, but it looks really interesting. And for those of you who would like to meet up with Jim, I'm told uh, he's available today uh, at in Foothills Lab 2, this building, and uh, room number 3055 or cubicle, one of those two. Anyway, uh, thanks again, Jim, for speaking, and I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. I, um, it's great to be back at NCAR, especially for the younger people in the audience. The first talk I gave here was in this room in about 1993, when I was a scared and petrified graduate student. I stand before you today as a scared and petrified old fart. <laughs> Time flies. Uh, but I've always liked speaking here because of the elevated stage. It just gives a commanding sense of power. I mean, I just feel so much more confident here than I do elsewhere when I give talks, which is really great. I'll be talking today about winter storms and complex terrain, perspectives from the greatest uh, snow climates on Earth. And this is work that w my group has been doing in collaboration with several other institutions, both in the United States and in, in Japan, many, many scientists. I'd like to just take a second to highlight the graduate students who have done a lot of the work at the University of Utah, Leah Campbell, Julie Cunningham, Ashley Evans, Tom Gowan. Make sure I get them all, especially Michael Wasserstein, who's here today. Uh, Peter Vielst and uh, Tyler West. So a lot of great stuff. So I'll be talking about really about three major regions today. Uh, the first is going to be the, the Tug Hill Plateau, where I like to say they see the most intense snowstorms on Earth. I grew up in upstate New York, and I used to cross-country ski on the Tug Hill Plateau. And they get very intense uh, lake effect storms there. So I was pretty excited to go back for the Owls Field Campaign about 10 years ago and be involved in that. I'll be talking about Japan's Gosetsu Shitai, or heavy snow region, and I like to call this the greatest snow climate on Earth. The state of Utah does not allow me to call Japanese snow the greatest snow on Earth. Um, they get very upset, so I always call it the greatest snow climate on Earth, even though Japan might be better than Utah in some ways. And uh, we'll talk about CFX storms there. And if we have time, I'll be talking about some of the work we're doing on orographic precipitation in, in Little Cottonwood Canyon uh, in northern Utah. So we'll be talking first about lake and sea effect precipitation. So just to get everybody on the same page, this is precipitation produced primarily by boundary layer convection that is generated, enhanced, and organized by sensible and latent heat fluxes and associated boundary layer mesoscale circulations as cold air moves over relatively uh, warm water. And that's kind of the, the basic definition, but when you actually look at these lake and sea effect storms and you're trying to understand what controls where the most intense or where, where snowfall is occurring, they get complicated pretty quickly. So these come of these complicating factors are characteristics of the upstream air mass, the shoreline geometry, both on the windward and the leeward shoreline of the body of water, the characteristics of the boundary layer and mesoscale circulations. The mesoscale circulations commonly are land breeze circulations, uh, but there are terrain generated circulations that can be important. Uh, characteristics of the upstream and downstream orography, in some areas, like the Great Lakes, there are multi-sea uh, or multi-lake effects that can be very important, and in some cases, uh, ice cover. So things get very complicated quite quickly. Here's just an example from the Sea of Japan, where you see a, a number of boundary layer circulations there, longitudinal mode convection, transversal mode convection, something called the Japan Polar Air Mass uh, Convergence Zone. So many things going on there to affect the distribution of clouds and precipitation. So the key issues that my group has been working on really for a number of, of years, and a hot hat tip to Justin Minder of SUNY Albany for this slide, is how do mesoscale forcings, in particular orography, and surface fluxes 
modulate the storm and cloud dynamics, the updraft characteristics, for example, the boundary layer and the mesoscale organization of the clouds, and finally, how does that shape the cloud and precipitation structures? So we've been looking at two major regions. One is Lake Ontario and the Tuggy Hill Plateau. So Lake Ontario is an elongated body of water that's about 300 kilometers long. And on its east side, there's the Tug Hill Plateau, which ironically is neither a hill nor a plateau. I don't know what the, what the geologists classify it as, but we can call it an upland region if we want that rises about 500 meters above uh, lake level. And then also moving to the Sea of Japan and the Japanese archipelago, Sea of Japan's about 12 times bigger than Lake Superior, so it's a very large body of water. Um, and it, you have topography uh, in Japan that rises 1,000 to almost 3,000 meters above, above the Sea of Japan. So very large orography in contrast to what we have downstream of the Laurentian Great Lakes in, in North America. So just to kind of show the terrain here on the top here, you have the Tug Hill Plateau. And when I give talks at the Mountain Meteorology Conference on this, I usually tell them I, I want the award for the wimpiest mountain at the meeting. The Tug Hill Plateau rises 500 meters, but at, at an almost imperceptible and very continuous grade of about 1.5%. So it's an incredibly shallow uh, windward slope there. In contrast, uh, Japan is very varied topographically, depends on where you are, but I'll be looking a lot at the Hokuriku region, and the Haida Mountains there are very rugged and very large. These are sometimes referred to as the Northern Japanese Alps, and in this terrain you're getting to, to elevations certainly well over 2,000 meters, and in some place, cases uh, close to, to 3,000 meters. But even though the Tug Hill Plateau is a pretty wimpy mountain, we see very uh, localized, what appears to be orographic uh, enhancement of snowstorms in individual storms, but also in terms of long-term uh, radar statistics. So here we see a storm, this is from 1997, where we see snowfall increasing from 90 uh, centimeters right on the coast of, of Lake Ontario to almost 240 centimeters on Tug Hill Plateau. And this is in January when that's not due, for example, to the snow level being in an odd spot. And if we look at uh, the characteristics of, of radar, for example, echo frequencies greater than 10 dBZ or 30 dBZ, you can see this pronounced maximum during lake effect periods kind of on the windward slope of Tug Hill. So they see very strong enhancement in a lot of cases. And these storms tend to be very intense. Um, during these long lake axis uh, parallel banded periods, it's pretty common to see snowfall rates that are over 10 centimeters an hour, or over four inches an hour. And weather historian Christopher Burt has a nice quote where he says, snow rates during some events are the greatest ever measured on record for, from anywhere in the world. When we did the Owls Field campaign, we were there for about two months and we had five storms with snowfall rates that reached over four inches an hour and one where it was well over five inches an hour, but we kind of gave up on trying to figure out how hard it was really snowing. So really intense snowfall, dendrites coming down really, really hard. And people there are very proud of their snow. You know, I'm from Utah, the greatest snow on earth. So I always like to use this, this slide here on the right, the snow belt in where 10 inches is nothing. And uh, in uh, Tug Hill Plateau, it's all about snowmobiling instead of, instead of skiing. Japan's Gosetsu Shitai, or heavy snow region. This is the snowiest, densely populated place on earth. Snowiest uh, city in the world with a population over a million people is Sapporo with uh, average snowfall of 248 inches. So imagine two million people living in a place like, I don't know, Copper Mountain. <laughs> um, maybe give you a little bit of an idea. Sukayu Onsen is the snowiest inhabited place, likely the snowiest inhabited place on Earth, with a mean annual snowfall of over 1,750 centimeters. And then the one I like to use for my students in Utah to give an idea of just how insane the snow climate is in Japan is Sunan. This is a a railway observing site that Japan has. It's at 37 degrees latitude and 246 meters above sea level. It has an average annual snowfall of over 500 inches. That would be the, about the equivalent in Utah of St. George, Utah. You know, basically southern Utah, a place where it hardly ever snows at all, seeing over 500 inches of snow. It's truly, truly incredible. And uh, as a result, this area, uh, oh, I should also comment that the snow there comes hard and it comes fast. Their so-called winter monsoon is really about a three-month period from December to February. So most of this snow happens in a three-month period. So at Sukayu Onsen, 70% of their annual snowfall happens during the months of December, January, and February. So their seasonal snowpacks get really deep because they don't really have time to, to settle. It just keeps coming. And uh, so some of the world's deepest seasonal snowpacks are observed 
in parts of Japan, and as I like to tell people, the surest climatological bet for deep powder skiing is near the Sea of Japan during, during late January. It's just, uh, it just comes and it, and it keeps coming. This particular photo I took that somebody that was staying at a lodge near mine in the Miyoko Kogan, and it snowed two meters of snow in two days during this particular period. And it was so deep, you really couldn't ski anything. It's just, <laughs> what's that? It doesn't look like powder. Yeah, it was, that was, it was, it doesn't look like powder, but it was on, on this particular, I have other pictures if you want to see them, I can assure you it was powder. So anyway, I'll be talking today about results from a lot of, of uh, papers that are available on, on my website. I'll kind of it's trying to synthesize this into something that can be done in a reasonable amount of time. And there's just a quick summary of those, of those papers. A lot of this work comes from the OWLS uh, field campaign, stands for Ontario Winter Lake Effect Systems. Uh, field campaign involved a number of scientists. Dave Kristovich was probably the, the leader, he's the lead author of the, the BAMS article that came out in 97 about this field campaign. Involved the University of Wyoming King Air, three Doppler on, on wheels radars, mobile sounding units, and the University of Alabama Huntsville uh, MIPS system. My group, what we did, because we were very interested in orographic precipitation enhancement over Tug Hills, we established what we called an orographic transect, working with Justin Minder and his group at the State University of New York at Albany. So we put four of these profiling MRR radars, these are K-band radars in, operating them for the entire winter. And then we also did a number of snow crystal samples and, and did uh, measurements and other things. Basically from Lake Ontario, the east shore of Lake Ontario, up onto the upper plateau. Most of what I'll be talking about today is data from uh, Sandy Creek, which is right at the base of Tug Hill, and uh, North Redfield, which is on the, on the windward slope. So going into this, the prior conceptual models for why it snows so much on the hills downstream of the, of the Great Lakes is something in, where basically you see a colder outbreak over those lakes and you see warming, moistening, and deepening of the boundary layer over the lake, but then there's a, a lifting of the capping inversion layer as the flow moves over the terrain, um, and this results in an invigoration of the convection, which results in orographic enhancement. And this is a very nice, simple conceptual model, but unfortunately, it's wrong. Um, we actually hardly ever saw this during any storms on Tug Hill. Instead, what we would see is a situation like you see here on the bottom. This is profiling uh, radar data from Sandy Island Beach here on the coast of Lake Ontario and North Redfield. And the convection is actually much stronger right on the coast than it is over the Tug Hill Plateau. And so instead, what we found in storm after storm after storm was a convective to stratiform transition where the convective vigor was actually a lot weaker over Tug Hill than it was coming off of Lake Ontario. And in hindsight, that makes a lot of sense because that's where all the forcing for the convection is happening is over the lake. Um, and it's really the more persistent characteristics of the echoes over Tug Hill and the lack of subcloud evaporation and sublimation that really contributes to a lot to the enhancement. But there's also a non-orographic factor, which I'll be talking about here in a minute. So that conceptual model uh, needs updating and is, is not really valid for most of the storms. I'll also add that we also see this over Japan. In Japan, you also see a pronounced uh, convective stratiform transition that starts very abruptly right at the coast. We also looked a lot at uh, mesoscale and orographic forcing and kind of OWL's IOP2B was the kind of the big um, event for, for us to take a look at. And this was a period, a 24-hour period, where we got about 102 centimeters of snow and about 62.5 millimeters of water equivalent on the windward slope of Tug Hill. And that was approximately double what was observed right at the base of, of Tug Hill, so about a factor of two uh, enhancement. And this was a long lake axis parallel system. So these are elongated systems that form downstream or over uh, elongated lakes like Lake Ontario. They tend to modulate a little bit, and I'll talk about this in a minute. These systems sometimes break down and they become more of, a, of uh, having open cellular convection, and then they collapse down into a very intense mesoscale band, and so you'll see this kind of vacillation that occurs, and we'll talk about why that's important uh, in, as we move forward. So talking about the forcing, this is another conceptual model. Uh, really nice, simple model of what we believe happens over these elongated lakes. The idea that there is localized heating that leads to solenoidal circulation in which you have land breezes from the two flanking shorelines that converge near the lake axis, give you rising motion, helps to organize the, the lake band. And that's what you would expect with a, symmetrical, uh, with a symmetrical oval lake with flow down the major lake axis. 
The other kind of conceptual model that's sometimes talked about is one where you have uh, differential convergence due to the differential friction between the lake and the surrounding lake shores. And the differential friction leads to convergence on the right-hand shoreline relative to the flow streamwise and divergence on the uh, left-hand shoreline. So we, thinking about these things, the, the problem was when we were during OWLs is we kept noticing some odd things. And one of them was that we kept seeing double bands. We kept seeing two lake bands instead of just one. Sometimes we saw one, but when we kept seeing these two lake bands, I kept thinking, well, what, how does that conceptual model work in that situation? And then we also noticed that it was oftentimes pretty cold where we were on Tug Hill. And it didn't seem like the lake modified air mass was really making it, making it to us. And we kept wondering what was going on, going on there. And the issue at play here is that Lake Ontario is not symmetrical or oval. It actually has these coastline undulations that turn out to be important in affecting the lake effect systems. And in particular, it's these bulges on the southern uh, shoreline. So one here that's to the west of Rochester, New York, and one that's on the southeast shoreline that's near Oswego, New York, that modulates some of the characteristics of these lake effect systems. So when we do numerical simulations of, of OWL's IOP uh, 2B, what we find is very strong convergence that forms on that uh, sh uh, bulge in the south shoreline and extends downstream. And this is related to the frictional contrast that we saw in that idealized conceptual model, but it's being modulated by the shape of the shoreline. And uh, we also see convergence that forms uh, basically along that bulge in the southeast shoreline, and that actually cuts obliquely across the other convergence zone. And so we see these two areas of convergence that uh, set up. And if you'll notice here, there's a third one here that's downstream of Point Petrie, and that's one of the reasons why we kept seeing these double banded structures. But for Tug Hill, what we have happening is those areas of convergence lead to frontogenesis, and you get these basically these mesoscale coastal or land breeze fronts and convergence that extend downstream. And this becomes the locus for initiating these long lake axis uh, parallel bands. But then this second convergence zone cuts obliquely across it. And it becomes kind of an area where you can get enhanced vertical motion and precipitation growth and fallout that ultimately impacts Tug Hill. So there we have those features there. I won't be talking about this uh, feature coming up of Point, Point Petrie though. So there we see the numerical simulation and how those, those things come together. And in, if we kind of do a backwards trajectory analysis, it's, it's uh, quite interesting to take a look at, but the flow over the center of Lake Ontario has a very long res residence time over the lake, and that leads to this uh, warm anomaly on the downstream side of Lake Ontario. But this first feature that comes off the bulge in the south shoreline separates lake modified air from air that's actually moved through the land bridge between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. So it didn't experience any um, lake modification, maybe upstream over Lake Michigan, but until it moves out over the lake here farther downstream. So that creates a temperature contrast uh, that's along that kind of lake breeze front. And then for the air over Tug Hill, uh, that stuff actually goes right through this land breeze. It, it actually completely avoids uh, modification by Lake Ontario. And so you end up with a bare clinic zone between the lake modified air and this unmodified air that has moved through this land bridge between Lake Ontario and, and Lake Erie. It's really quite interesting. And here's how that feeds back into the precipitation dynamics. So now we're looking at a cross section, a zonal one from Lake Ontario to over Tug Hill. Here you can see the, the Tug Hill uh, plateau. And here you can see that bare clinic zone. So the effects of that bare clinic zone are basically to give a mesoscale forcing that's much stronger and much deeper than you would get from Tug Hill plateau alone. And so that leads to precipitation growth and fallout on, on the Tug Hill. We also see this in observations. So on the left, you have the uh, wharf simulation where we see this kind of flow. We're looking at now a cross section that's cutting obliquely across the, the lake band in the numerical simulation. This is the, the colder flow that's coming in uh, around the lake. Then you have the flow coming off the lake and the strong vertical motion and the banding. And in the King Air data, this is work done by Phil Bergmeier, who was a graduate student at the University of, of Wyoming. You can see this circulation really quite well. So it shows up both in the modeling and in, in the observations. Now, we've done some simulations to look at what the influence of Tug Hill is. So here we see uh, three, three figures, one where we're looking at um, 
radar-derived precipitation, and then the actual precipitation amounts, and think in terms of water equivalent here. Oh, no, excuse me, this is uh, radar-derived amounts. 35 millimeters, uh, 62 millimeters of water equivalent here, the localized maximum over Tug Hill. Then the simulation here on the right is the control run where we include Tug Hill, and you can see those numbers line up fairly well with what we have here, and you can see the local maximum over Tug Hill. Then if we take out Tug Hill Plateau, you still see you get a maximum right where Tug Hill is, and that's because you still have this land breeze front that's there. Um, but there is a, still an enhancement there that occurs over Tug Hill, and that is related to some of the orographic effects, but largely due to the lack of subcloud uh, sublimation below these, these uh, clouds that are moving over the, over the Tug Hill. Now, a quick comment on enhancement, and some of the things that we also observed now looking at shorter time scales. So, as I like to say, modality matters. In these long lake axis parallel systems, they sometimes form very intense and narrow um, bands, like you see here on the right, and then those will break down and you start seeing more of a broad area of open cellular convection. And these are subtle changes, but if you go in and you look carefully at the precipitation rates, what you find is that the orographic enhancement during these mesoscale banded periods is actually quite small. The precipitation rates are very high, both in the low coastal lowlands and over the Tug Hill Plateau. So the precipitation rates during the banded periods are the highest. But when you look at the orographic enhancement or the ratio of precipitation over Tug Hill compared to over the coastal lowlands, that number is just a little bit more than, than one. But when you go into these non-banded periods, the orographic enhancement goes up quite a bit. There's actually a lot less precipitation falling in the coastal lowlands, and it goes up even more over Tug Hill. So these are some subtle things that occur that affect uh, the precipitation rates uh, during, a, this is a 24-hour period, where we see this kind of vacillations in terms of the, the precipitation structures. So a few takeaways from Tug Hill. We have a lifting of the capping inversion, or the, the conceptual model that the lifting of the capping inversion and vigoration of convection, it's, it's not the, actually not that common over Tug Hill as suggested by prior conceptual models. Instead, we see a convective to stratiform transition. The lake geometry and the resulting air mass boundaries are important for the, the forcing of these long lake axis parallel bands and also the Tug Hill enhancement uh, during Owl's IOP2B. And this modality affects uh, the ratio of upland to lowland precipitation. And the precipitation rates are greatest during the banded periods, but the ratio of upland to lowland precipitation is largest during these, these non-banded periods. Okay, let's see how we're doing for time. Ah, good. Moving to uh, Japan. Uh, this is work that's based on uh, by a number of people, but in particular, uh, Peter Veals' work at the University of Utah. I just wanted to point out that's a picture of Peter skiing in Japan. On a day that when we finished, I told him he was the luckiest graduate student on the face of the earth, because we got to go to Japan and go skiing before we went to the Nagioka Snow and Ice uh, Data Center. We spent two days backcountry skiing in the Haida Mountains, and it was some of the best skiing I've ever had. So really fantastic stuff. So one of the things in Japan that they talk about are Yamayuki versus Satayuki uh, storms. And Yamayuki storms are storms that produce the heaviest precipitation and the most snowfall in the mountains. And the Satayuki storms are those that produce the most uh, snowfall in the, in the lowlands. And this is uh, something that was uh, discussed in the first English uh, paper that I, can rem uh, that I know of is in Magano et al, 1966. And this is their conceptual model of Satayuki snowfall. And you can see they have a strong inversion here that's right near mountaintop level, which would lead to topographic blocking. And you have most of the precipitation falling out, uh, falling out is occurring on the lowlands of Hokkaido Island. We're gonna be doing, this work that I'm gonna be presenting today is from the Hokuriku region, which is in uh, central Honshu where we have flow coming off the, of the Sea of Japan. It's a really complicated terrain patterns that you have there. It's not simple. You know, you think about nice 2D barriers. That's not really what you're dealing with there. Um, but we're gonna be looking at what happens in the uh, Ichigo Plain here and the Ichigo Mountains. I'll be skipping probably talking about the Haidas very much today. So we'll be looking at, at what happens there and kind of what controls the, the precipitation distribution. So to do this, we looked at long-term radar statistics uh, derived from a C-band uh, radar on the uh, coast of Honshu, which is located at this dot right here. And Peter went in and did a very comprehensive radar climatology. And one of the things he did was identify the sea effect periods and then break them down, looking at low quintile incident flow versus mid quintile versus upper quintile. And the strength of the flow is really important because it affects two things. It affects both the inland penetration of the sea effect features 
but it also affects the ability of the flow to move over the topography and enhance the flow. So what we see happening here is in these low U-bar periods, the radar echoes are confined primarily to the, to the coastal lowlands. There's actually uh, still light precip in the mountains. It doesn't show up in the radar. This is related to blockage issues. But for the most part, um, it's, the precipitation rates are greater on the coastal plain than they are in the mountains. But then as the precipitation, or the, excuse me, the incident flow picks up, then we see precipitation maximizing first over the initial slopes of the Ichigo Mountains and then eventually even farther inland. So the strength of the incident flow is, is, quite, uh, is quite important. We also see this in simulations of individual events. So you can see how the, in this case, we have a situation where the flow is, is weak to begin with. Precipitation is maximized either in, in the coastal, uh, uh, initial coastal hills or the coastal plains. And then we see it moving inland over time. And if we look at the flow patterns in this case, you can see here this kind of blocking or coastal front that sets up in the low, the low flow periods, how that breaks down as the flow picks up, which results in an inland shift uh, into the mountains. The skiers really like to know about this because they want to know when it's going to snow in the mountains. Now, what's interesting about this is in Japan, you've got this enormous topography. So it's great to think about the potential for blocking. But we also see this in Tug Hill which is only 500 meters high, it's almost always in a flow over situation. So we don't see a lot of topographic blocking there. But if we break down events in Tug Hill into these lower quintile and upper quintile periods, you can see again this shift where you basically have the highest frequency of echoes you know, in the coastal lowlands or on that initial slope of the Tug Hill. You can see that also in this vertical cross section. But when you're in the stronger U-bar periods, everything shifts inland and it's over, the, over Tug Hill. So this shows that it's not just an orographic problem. It's it also is related to characteristics of the lake effect convection, how it breaks down, how far inland it can be, the uh, hydrometeors can be transported. We've also done a breakdown by lake effect mode because we saw modality being important for orographic enhancement. So this is also on Tug Hill, where now we're looking at low U-bar periods on top. So this is weaker incident flow, stronger incident flow uh, at the bottom. And we've broken it down based on uh, lake convective available potential energy as well. I'm not going to talk about that too much. But basically, during these weak wind periods, when you have uh, non-banded precipitation features versus very strong mesoscale banding, it doesn't matter. You get most of the precipitation is greatest right in the coastal lowlands or the initial slope of Tug Hill. But when we look at strong flow periods, the strongest enhancement is during the non-banded periods. If you have a band, a strong mesoscale band, you don't see a lot of enhancement. So you really need to be in this non-banded situation, and we'll talk about why, why next. So to do that, we're going to talk about idealized cloud modeling. And this was done by uh, Tom Gowan, who's a graduate student in my group and now works for Spire here in, in Boulder. And what we were doing here with this cloud modeling was trying to understand better the coastal to inland transition that occurs in lake effect storms, and then also the orographic effects and how these two things uh, work together. So to do this, Tom uh, used the uh, CM1, George Bryan's model. And he basically uh, looked at, configured it in six different ways. So he used uh, two lake shapes. One is a, an oval shape. So this is a pure oval shape. So we don't have all these complicated uh, shoreline inflections to produce a long lake axis parallel band. And then he used what we called an open lake, which basically is an infinite lake uh, across the flow. Um, kind of imagining a Sea of Japan situation where there's no real influences from flanking uh, coastlines. And then he ran with no topography. He ran with a um, 500 meter high plateau and he ran with a 2000 meter high ridge. So this was to kind of get an idea of the, the full uh, distribution. You can see some of the details. These were, these were done at 125 meter horizontal uh, grid spacing. So the environment we used for this, this was uh, derived from looking at um, observed soundings from the Sea of Japan and from um, the Lake Ontario area. It's typical with a well-mixed uh, boundary layer, uh, a stable layer between uh, 800 and 750 millibars. And we, uh, we used a, a lake temperature of 8.35 degrees Celsius. And all these simulations use the same wind with no shear. So it's 12 and a half meters per second, uh, which is equivalent of 60th percentile uh, boundary layer flow on, on Lake Ontario. So just to take a look now, first of all, at this long lakes axis parallel band. 
So this is without any topography. And you can see here, this is when we do get that nice symmetrical in, up, and out situation with a pure oval lake, very much like the conceptual model that we looked at earlier. But if you look carefully, we still get a land breeze front on the downstream shoreline. So these, these blue contours here are uh, potential temperature. And you can see there's a downstream cold pool with a bare clinic zone on its upstream side. And so we have a land breeze front that's right there. And if, if that forms for two reasons, one is you actually have flow that circumscribes the lake. And again, the air mass downstream of the lake at low levels has not been modified by the lake. The flow actually is kind of wrapped around it, circumscribed the lake. So this is still continental unmodified air. But then you also have sublimation occurring in that air mass to also strengthen the cold pool. So the downstream cold pool and the land breeze front they ultimately serve as a, this locus for inland precipitation enhancement, even in the absence of topography. And if you look very carefully, and we zoom in now here, what you find is beneath the land breeze front, there's actually a precipitation minimum. And you end up with a maximum downstream in the cold pool. And the reason for this is the intense vertical motion at the land breeze front. And what that acts to do is loft the hydrometeors right over the land breeze front, and they get carried at, downstream and fall out. So you actually end up with less precipitation right at the coastal front. It falls out downstream, which is really quite, quite nice. So if you cut Tug Hill down, you'd still get a precipitation maximum there. Now, again, like we saw in some of the observations, during these uh, mesoscale banded periods, we actually don't see strong orographic enhancement. Um, if we add a 500 meter high plateau, we see a pretty similar pattern and it, but it's only about a 13% increase in total precipitation at altitudes above two, 200 meters. So the orographic enhancement during these mesoscale banded periods is fairly small. If we go in and we put an enormous uh, ridge in there, say 1,000 or 2,000 meters, in this case 2,000 meters, what happens is you get flow stagnation on the, up, uh, on the windward side of the, of the barrier. And then the, the lake-induced circulations take over, and this actually acts to give you an offshore flow and the precipitation maximum actually moves over the lake. Um, so very, when you get strong blocking, um, and they see this in Japan sometimes, that the, the banding can sometimes not be over, over land, but sometimes over the Sea of Japan. Okay, now moving to the open lake situation. In open lake, we get uh, open cellular uh, convection. And as we saw in our MRR data from um, Tug Hill Plateau, what happens in these runs is there's a rapid decrease in convective vigor at the coast the rug gets pulled out, of the, out from under the convection. And we see a, a rapid transition uh, to broader uh, mesoscale ascent as the flow moves over the cooler uh, inland era. Um, and we get more precipitation inland during these situations uh, due to transport and fallout mesoscale ascent, but also decreased subcloud sublimation. So um, again, rapid decrease in convective vigor uh, right at the coast. Now, if we add topography, this is when we start to see now a lot of enhancement. So during these open cellular periods, we get lifting of that air mass and we see an increase in convective vigor. So basically when we have a plateau, there's about a 219% increase in the total precipitation that's over 200 meters. And we get a big ridge line, we get flow over and we see again, really strong more intense convection and a factor of eight increase in precipitation. So the takeaways from this are lake effect characteristics are influenced by the strength of the impinging flow, the mode of the lake effect system, the development of coastal or land breeze or blocking fronts, hydrometeor transport and fallout, and uh, other orographic processes. So the way I try to think about this is I try to think inland and orographic enhancement rather than orographic enhancement, because it's really this kind of interplay between the lake effect system that processes the strength of the flow and the orography that gives you the precipitation distribution and intensity that you, that you see in these storms. So I still have a few more minutes, so I think I'm gonna transition now to something that I think is fun because I'm a skier and work that uh, Michael Wasserstein did for his master's thesis on uh, Little Cottonwood Canyon. So Little Cottonwood Canyon is a canyon in Utah that's one of the snowiest locations in the interior United States and it's famous for uh, deep potter skiing. And we're, Michael's been looking at uh, the diverse characteristics of extreme orographic snowfall events uh, in this canyon. That's the photo you see here is Little Cottonwood Canyon. It's also fairly unique. Imagine if you lived in Denver, Colorado, and you only had to drive six to eight miles to, to go skiing, okay? 
So this is our I-70 right here, a two-lane road that goes to Alta, Utah, and it climbs uh, in eight miles from the eastern edge of uh, Salt Lake City to Alta, Utah, which averages over 500 inches of snow a year. So that's our I-70. <laughs> but Little Cottonwood Canyon, as dangerous as I-70 might be, uh, Little Cottonwood Canyon is one of the most dangerous highways for avalanches in the world. 7,000 cars a day travel beneath 50 avalanche paths in that eight mile highway, along the eight mile highway. The highway on average is hit by 33 avalanches a year. And the avalanche folks have a, a hazard index that they use to determine the risk along highways. And the road up Little Cottonwood Canyon has the highest unmitigated avalanche hazard index of any major road in the world. Meaning if they don't do work to reduce avalanche hazard, it's by far the most exposed highway anywhere in the world. I think the only one that's even close to it is this highway that's down in, on the South Island of New Zealand, way down in Southern New Zealand. It's also the only place in the United States where live artillery is shot over the heads of civilians. So avalanche control work at, at Alta is changing some. The US military is pushing to get away from doing this, but they're still using 105 millimeter howitzer shells. They're about this long and 105 millimeters in diameter to do a lot of the avalanche control work. And because of where people live and where they need to put these guns, they actually are shooting over the heads of civilians. And when they do this, they go into what's called interlodge and you're legally mandated not to go outside. Um, and the cost of closure uh, is about $3 million a day. So it's a, it's a big deal to keep this, this highway open. This provides some perspective on it. This is the state highway that goes up Little Cottonwood Canyon, Snowbird Ski Area, Alta here. The most dangerous paths are these mid canyon paths here because they're very difficult to do control work in. The White Pine Chutes, the White Pine Slide Path, and uh, Little Pine uh, Slide Path. Now, there's been some renewed interest in the weather of Little Cottonwood Canyon for a number of reasons, and in particular, the winter of 2022-23 where Alta received over 2,000 centimeters of snow, 903 inches of snow in six months. And it snowed so much and the avalanches were so common and so persistent and all the avalanche paths got fully buried all the way to the highway that Utah Department of Transportation basically said at one point in March that we can't keep this road open anymore and they just shut it down. So this is a huge loss of, for economics for, for the state of Utah. Um, so some paths ran to the highway for the first time since uh, 1983. Um, the canyon closed 42 times overnight, and it was closed for several multi-day periods. And so uh, you tell ski areas that do $3 million a day in revenue that they're not going to be open for a week or two. They don't get very happy. So pretty incredible stuff. So we've been looking at kind of what happens at Alta from a synoptic perspective, just to kind of give a little bit of a background. This is the Alta and Little Cottonwood Canyon are in the Wasatch Range. It's approximately a meridionally running mountain range. But what's interesting is around Little Cottonwood Canyon, there are these transverse ridges that run more zonally. And that creates this island of high topography. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a minute. And the map on the right shows you kind of the, the hydrologic uh, definition of Little Cottonwood Canyon with all the dark blue areas being these, these avalanche paths. And we'll be looking at data that we collected with a profiling radar at Alta in the town of Alta it's from 2,600 meters about. But most of the snowfall data we get is from the snow safety team at Alta, and that's collected at almost uh, 3,000 meters. So the thing about these north-south running mountain range with east-west running ridges is that creates this uh, three-dimensional topography. It's a lot more complicated than a 2D barrier. And the net result of this is the high terrain around Little Cottonwood Canyon is exposed to flow and gets orographic lifting from flow from almost any direction. So when we look at the flow directions for 12 hour precipitation extremes defined in terms of either 95th percentile snowfall or 95th percentile uh, water equivalent, Alta sees extremes at the 95th percentile for flow from anywhere from southeasterly all the way around to north northwesterly. There's a tendency for that it to be most common from west northwest and southwest, but they can get clobbered from almost any, any direction. So it's a remarkable diversity of storms. And this contrasts with the kind of thing that you might see when you have a more linear barrier where you would probably see a pretty focused maximum based on flow that's oriented perpendicular to the barrier. 
We also see a lot of synoptic patterns that generate heavy snowfall at Alta. So Michael went through and we identified a number of, of different synoptic patterns. First of all, we have situations where we have elevated um, integrated vapor transport. And those can come from the south, the southwest, the west, or the northwest. So we see precipitation events, serious precipitation events with elevated IVT from a big range of compass directions uh, at Alta. The other thing that's uh, interesting are these northwesterly postfrontal periods. I'll show those in a minute. These are cases where we have, we're postfrontal, we're getting orographic convection in northwesterly flow. And then the other big one is our frontal periods. And then there's a few other things that happen, but those are the three big ones I'll be talking about today. So these are, um, these IVT events are all cases of decaying atmospheric rivers. We do not see true AR level integrated vapor transport conditions in Northern Utah very often. Basically we're down below 250 most of the time. So most of these are between 100 and 200 uh, uh, joules per kilogram per Kelvin. And we have to have flow that comes in and up the lower Colorado uh, River Basin which is the southerly and the southwesterly flow events, or we have to have flow that comes through the Cascades and over the um, Snake River Plain and comes into Utah for two reasons. Well, for really for one reason, because that avoids the High Sierra. <laughs> that, those are the topographic pathways to get water vapor into the, the inner mountain interior. So we don't see any IVT pathway affect producing large events at, in Little Cottonwood Canyon where they cross the Southern High Sierra. So I, a, atmospheric rivers between Lake Tahoe and the Southern end of the Sierras, that's the graveyard for atmospheric rivers. And it um, means we don't get a lot of snow when the flow is coming from, directly from that direction. Now the post-frontal events are interesting because these are very low IVT events. So they have very little integrated vapor transport. This is the uh, time integrated vapor transport for 12 hour periods that are producing these 95th percentile snow or water equivalent extremes. And the post frontal events are all of these um, orange circles that you see here, pretty close to the, the origin here because they're very low integrated vapor transport. And we'll see in a minute, these are very shallow events in which there's extremely efficient conversion of water vapor into snowfall, okay? So if we look at the ratio of precipitation to time integrated vapor transport, these are far more efficient than the atmospheric river uh, events. It's really quite, uh, quite interesting. So I mentioned that these events are, are relatively shallow. Last two winters, we operated uh, profiling radars, these MRR systems at, at Highland High School here in the Salt Lake Valley and at Alta here in Little Cottonwood Canyon. That happens to be a, a pretty good, that's like the maximum flow direction for for these big events at, at Alta. And what you find, if we look at uh, uh, what's called a CFAD here, the frequency of radar echoes, is you see a tremendous amount of low level snow growth during these storms. And if you look at echo tops, five dBZ echoes are rarely above uh, 5,000 meters above sea level. That's below 500 millibars. And you can look at the frequency of these five uh, dBZ echoes and you can see how incredible the growth is going down to low levels. This stuff is very, very shallow. And if we look at the, what the median echo top height is for minus 10 dBZ echoes, it's 1260 meters AGL, okay? So half of these storms or half of these storm periods, basically echo tops are 1260 meters above ground level. It's not uncommon for it to be snowing an inch or two an hour at Alta and you can see the sun through the clouds. So these are remarkably uh, shallow storms. And the orographic precipitation enhancement as I like to tell people, if you look at what happens over the valley, notice that the frequency of echoes is, goes down over the valley as you approach the ground. That's because of sublimation. This is one of the untold mechanisms for producing the large orographic precipitation gradients we see in the inner mountain west, is that we're not just looking at enhancement over the mountains, but we're seeing precipitation losses occurring at low levels because we have dry air in the valleys. So to, takeaways here are this remarkable diversity of storm characteristics, apparently due to three-dimensional topographic effects. And I didn't mention it here, but we do get some lake effect off the Great Salt Lake, and that's a factor. 
Um, pathways for high IVT events avoid the Southern High Sierras, and we see extremes frequently in very low IVT post-frontal environments in which intense shallow or graphic snowfall, snow growth occurs. And with that, I think my time is up, and I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. We uh, will take questions from both the audience and also online through Slido. And if we have any questions, we'll use the mic. Do you have a Slido? Um, I believe this person kind of answered the question themselves, but. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh. So Andy Hamesfield uh, asked, uh, what are the approximate peak vertical velocities in the Sea of Japan and lake effect snow bands? Yeah, if, if he asked me that without answering the question, I would have had to say meters per second and be vague. <laughs> but I would say that's probably, several meters per second is probably what I would have guessed off the top of my head. I, I just, I, I don't remember that, the number though, um, but that would be what I would anticipate. And Andy also asked, I now see for lake effect snow bands. Yeah, that's him answering his question. Yeah. So gotcha. thanks for the question. Um, and for answering it, that's even better yet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, are, does Lake Erie behave similar to uh, Lake Ontario without having that conspicuous tug hill? Yeah, the long lake axis parallel bands that form on Lake Erie are pretty similar to those on Lake Ontario. Um, but I haven't looked very carefully at it. I mean, there's a plateau downstream of Lake, Lake Erie as well. Um, the one thing that's interesting on Lake Erie is sometimes from the mesoscale forcing perspective, the air on the south side of Lake Erie is actually colder than it is on the north side because the north side has actually been modified by Lake Michigan. And I've often noticed that there's a, a pretty strong, strong asymmetry that seems to occur because of that, but I, um, I haven't really looked at it in much, in much depth. Um, we've also done some work looking at um, flow across Lake Erie interacting with the Allegheny Plateau. Um, and that's interesting too, but you see a lot of these same effects where the strength of the flow is important. What, and that's actually kind of a nice situation. It's a little bit simpler than Tug Hill in some respects, like whether or not you get heavy snow right along the coast there to the east of Cleveland versus up on the plateau. There's a lot of, a lot of this seems to apply pretty well to that, but we have not uh, published that yet, so. Yes. Thank you. I find this a very interesting talk in a number of aspects. First of all, I'm also a skier. I spent <laughs> a lot of time looking at measurements inside clouds, mostly thunderstorm type clouds, but also stratiform. And I've spent some time looking at clouds uh, in Japan uh, from their launch sites in Tanagashima Island. But uh, I know that in the Sea of Japan, when you have these winter storms that come across, that there's a lot of lightning mm. associated with the storms that are at the edge of the Sea of Japan and the land. And then la apparently later go on to produce the orographic effects you're talking about. I'm curious in uh, Lake Ontario, you talked about more convection right there at the mm. you know, edge of the lake and the mountain. Do you get electrification and lightning yeah. in those storms? Yeah, do we do and we do get it inland still. Um, it's not my area though, but I mean, during no, owls, I, there was a lot of um, lightning that occurred during one event. It might have been ILP six or seven, and I think Scott, Scott Steiger's group has done some work on that. And um, a lot of it, I think, was this uh, what do they call it? This high tower initiated lightning, you know, like it occurs over the, um, the wind farm and yes. that sort of thing on Tug Hill Plateau. It's quite interesting, but electrification is not my. Not my no, role. I understand. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a rare breed where I look at both, but um, presumably on top of Tug Hill, most of that precipitation is aggregation of snowflakes yeah. and probably not grapple. There's, it was remarkable how little grapple we saw at, on Tug Hill. 
um, I assume most of it falls out in but, the coastal zone, the grapple does. probably not in the convection. Yeah. I don't know, does the king air happen to go through the convective regions? Do you know what their microphysics was like? So I would probably refer you to Phil Bergmeier's work or okay. Dan Welsh's, because they were the ones that were analyzing that. Yeah. But that's, that's consistent with the ground observations. This is anecdotal, you know, where we would find grapple more commonly in the coastal areas. Yeah. And then inland, you kind of get lots of dendrites, dendrites and dendritic aggregates and that sort of yeah. thing. So, I know in the Sea of Japan where they have lightning that there is grapple. Yeah. And that seems to be a necessary ingredient. Thank you. The, one of the best ways to get thunder snow is to have a lake effect storm. <laughs> is the influence of the Great Salt Lake strong enough that you can see in the snowfalls, the seasonal snowfalls, the signal of de decreasing surface area of the lake, or is it just not that strong, or there haven't been enough I mean, we seasons? Don't know the, we don't know the answer to that question. So uh, a, a while ago, one of my students, Christian Yeager, looked at about, I think, a 12-year period, 12 cool seasons. We identified every uh, lake effect storm, and we quantified the amount of precipitation that was produced all around the Great Salt Lake Basin during those periods. We call them lake effect periods because we could, you can't, there's so much stuff going on in these post frontal periods that you, it's not all lake effect. There's other things going on. It gets complicated. And in the area that gets the, the most lake effect precipitation, which is Little Conwood Canyon, about 6% of the cool season precipitation and water equivalent was produced during these periods. So it's small, right? Now, we maybe didn't do that perfectly, and the lake at that time was about average size or smaller. So if you were to go, if we had radar data back into the 80s, or if we were to do, say, run a regional climate model with 1980s lake levels, which were way higher than they are now, the lake was like three times bigger than it is, it would be very interesting to see what we would get. So it's, it's a really important question, too, because Utah is struggling with the reality of a diminishing Great Salt Lake. So the, the history of terminal saline lakes around the world where we're, there, people are extracting water for irrigation is not a good one, right? And so we set our all-time record low lake level, I think, two years ago now. And the last two years were big snow years, and we've gotten up to lake elevation on the south arm now is 4,195 feet, which is still three feet below what's considered to be the minimum level that, that all the ecologists want. But because of the lake being small, we have a lot more dust production uh, coming off the old playa. And that dust, because the lake is a terminal lake and there's a large mining history and everything else in Utah, there's a lot of crap in that dust. So it's a big question mark for health and air quality. Um, and then also, I mean, Utah is a pretty conservative state, but our conservative legislature is actually quite concerned about the, the loss of the Great Salt Lake. So you have a lot of people now both sides of the aisle trying to work together to try to figure out if it can be saved. Uh, the hard part is, is it's, it's estimated the lake is 10 feet lower than it would be if it wasn't for extraction of water going to the lake over the last 150 years, right? So every year you're siphoning off a little bit and it's an integrator of all that. So it's gonna be a big challenge. So there's a study that came out from Utah State where they looked at one case too and they showed reductions in precip, but seasonals really, and cool season is what you really wanna look at, so. Any other questions? Great. All right, question Ooh. from Jimmy Dudia. Uh, very interesting talk. Any sense of the avalanche risk <laughs> increasing with climate change? Yeah, that's a loaded question. Um, in fact, I just was staying with a friend of mine in Leadville who's an avalanche, I, I won't give away who he is, um, but he's an avalanche professional and we were talking a lot about this because there's so many different types of avalanches and there's so many different ways that you can develop an unstable snowpack. And then you have humans, which are the primary trigger of avalanches that actually kill or injure people, that it really depends on what, what avalanches you're talking about. And um, for the most part, it's very difficult to generalize uh, an answer to that question, except to say in areas where it's not gonna snow anymore, the avalanche frequency is likely to go down a lot. <laughs> but elsewhere, 
it's complicated, right? We're seeing a shift maybe to larger storms, for example, so those might go up, but you have other areas where the snowpack might not be as deep. There might be more anchors. There's a good article in, I think, Frontiers of Science, and what they talked about was um, they expected more traumatic injuries and avalanches because of shallower snowpacks in general, that, that people would be bouncing off of more stuff if they're caught in an avalanche. So tough answer to the question to answer, Jimmy. Sorry, I can't answer it succinctly, but I don't know if anybody can. So. All right. Well, we're getting towards the end of the hour, and uh, I'd just like to mention again that Jim Steinberg can be found in FL2 3055 today if you'd like to meet up and talk some more science with him. Or, or if snow. Like, if you'd like to talk with him at lunch, too. We're going to go have lunch in the cafeteria. So. Or at lunch. Great. So let's uh, thank our speaker again. Uh, for a fascinating talk. Thank you.